Dr. Reddy um, for that far-reaching uh, and uh, very insightful talk uh, that really has touched upon so many aspects of uh, the current challenges that we face as well as the current potential that is out there. Um, without much ado, I'm just going to open the uh, floor to questions and answers. Dr. Reddy has very kindly agreed to take questions. So what I'll do is perhaps take two or three questions uh, at the same time and then request Dr. Reddy uh, to respond. Um, I see a number of hands. Let me start from the front and then I'll move my way back. Professor T. N. Srinivasan. And please announce your name if uh, for some reason, and forgive me, I do not know you, but please do announce your name. If I do know you, I'll actually take your name because we are doing a recording of this session. Tien. Fascinating lecture. I think you need to hold the microphone. Thank you for your fascinating lecture. But I want to pick up on one point. You said that our target current account deficit should be zero and target revenue deficit should be zero. If my memory does not serve me right, let me leave it that way. But if my memory serves me right, for the first 30 years after independence, we had roughly zero current account deficit, and we had roughly zero revenue deficit. I don't recall our having anything higher than 3.5% growth on an average. No, either we exa exaggerated the risks, and so we were very prudent by following those policies, and now we, everything has changed, and so we should again come back to that policy for different Would you like to just answer? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's an extremely important point. Uh, there is a difference. I think as economists we know there are different equilibria. One equilibrium is low level of savings, low level of export, low level of import, low level of investment. That's one level equilibrium. There is another equilibrium where you have high savings, high investment, high exports, high imports. So I am pleading for moving to the second type of equilibrium. My submission is if we consider it to be unrealistic, I'm not sure because many countries have adopted that. And most of the countries that have developed, especially in the last 30 years, had adopted that strategy. So unless we believe that we'll go back to, if we don't allow current account deficit, we'll go back to the lower equilibrium. So that's, that's an assumption. And in fact, even with regard to the capital flow, I would, uh, I would suggest, I would say that there's a capital outflow which is happening and there'll be capital inflow. There's no doubt about it. Well, there can be, that's why I keep saying there's a difference between gross and net. So there can be gross and net inflows, gross and net over a period in between uh, outflows and inflows. So it's at a, you can have uh, this type of equilibrium at a higher level of activity. Uh, Sujit Bhalla. Yeah. <clears throat> in, in all this discussion about investment and growth rates in 8 and 9 percent, for about 20 odd years, we grew at something like 5.5 percent with 24 percent investment rate. And we've now moved to something like an average of 36% investment rate. Now, if we, how much is the extra growth we can get? And if we are moving between two equilibria, uh, are we to move towards a 5.5% GDP growth with 35% investment rate? Would you understand? So, Jeet, just uh, would you mind uh, I think detailing a little more yeah. the transition so my, question. My question is that basically in this transition between equilibria that you talked about, uh, we have moved to a new equilibria as far as investment goes, and our growth rate has now collapsed. So either our investment goes, so how do you foresee the future? Either our investment rates come down or our growth rate goes up. Okay. No, no, uh, I, I, I think the basically the issue is uh, whether the, the answer lies in differentiating between cyclical and structural factors, I presume. 
once you factor in cyclical factors, then part of it, at least significant part of it, should be explained. Or if it is not, then it has to be explained in terms of the uh, capital output ratios or productivity. So if it has come down to 6% in the last couple of years, and if the investment has gone up 30, from 24 to 36, and it's come back to 6%, now it can be explained only by 2. And I don't think it is true that suddenly the, uh, the, uh, the productivity in the economy has gone down. So obviously there are elements of uh, uh, cyclical uh, factors. So I agree that we'll have to make an analysis. But the question is simple. Uh, the, the basic formulation I'm making is, look at the empirical evidence about the, uh, about the foreign savings being an instrument of growth. Second, who may it, uh, maybe my, my assumption is wrong. I've not done research on that. But it'll be good to look at the countries where uh, significant growth has happened through foreign savings or current account deficit. Second, what I'm saying is, particularly in India's context, which includes the socio-political context, should there be a ceiling or what we can, what is, what is likely to be tolerated by the global financial markets, given all the uncertainties. But if you think, if there's a judgment, it's really a political economy issue, if there's a judgment that, the, the, that despite the risks, so what, in other words, what should be the average current account deficit over the medium term? If you say the average should be 2.5, yes, we can have an average of 2.5, which means in bad years, it will be 4.5 or 3.5. My limited point is, is it our assessment that we will get that type of uh, uh, foreign savings when we are vulnerable to shocks? If that is not, or we'll be able to handle that volatility. It's, that's all. But if it is assumed, uh, or if it is assessed, that we can in some years afford more than 3.5 or 3 when there are shocks, then I think uh, we should go in for it. So only, that's the only question I'm saying. There are global uncertainties, and the average is different from the ceiling. There is a, virtually a ceiling in the global economy beyond which the global economy may not be willing to finance India's current account deficit comfortably. That's the risk there. That's all my submission. Uh, and in the final analysis, the best way of establishing competitive efficiency is, is through showing your, through, is expressed through current account. The lady at the back with the microphone. Usha Teja, Director, AER Center, Delhi University. Uh, food inflation is a great worry and great challenge in our country. So far, the policies tried by us could not uh, succeed anyway, and particularly protein items and uh, fruits and vegetables, they are too expensive, and a large proportion of population is suffering. What are your uh, opinions on that, that what should we do? We have uh, tried several measures so far. What is your opinion that how we can solve the problem and bring it to comfortable level of 5-6%? Thank you. So th that indeed is a tough one. <laughs> but, I, I, but I would say more generally, uh, the, 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 the big issues for us are really sectoral issues, the, the sort of brick and mortar issues, whether it is food, whether it is education, health, uh, and in fact, I'm glad that my, much of uh, the, the agenda for the policy forum uh, are on sectoral issues. And so, yes, I think food inflation and agriculture as a whole uh, is something that we have to attend to. Uh, so in terms of reform priorities, if you ask me, uh, that uh, the greatest attention has to be given sector by sector. And let us accept much of the work relating to food has to be at the state level, by the very nature of the sector, except international trade, except international trade, and perhaps advanced agriculture research. Except international trade and advanced agriculture research, if you remove the barriers within the country, then it's essentially a state subject. And states should be able to be incentivized rather than produce standard package schemes from the center to different states. Yes, maybe two, three states will do worse, but there may be two, three states which will do better and the others will follow. And food, food is one item. In, I, I can even go to the extent of saying that retail, retail business 
a retail business licensing and whatever everything that has to do with retail business is essentially a municipal subject or a state subject. So who should own the retail business can easily be decided by the state. It is not, it has no security implication. It has no huge externalities. So if there's local, uh, I, I must share with you uh, a very interesting experiment we, experience I had when Dr. Jalan was governor of the Bank of India. I'm not sharing a secret. We wanted to have a clean note policy and where the old notes had to be destroyed manually. It was taking a lot of time. So we had a series of measures to clean up and make sure that everybody gets clean notes. And when this was introduced, there was huge labor resistance, particularly from one state. So Governor Jalan simply said, no problem. Whichever state does not cooperate, they will get only side notes. <laughs> because you are not allowing us, and so we can't do that. And whichever state agrees. Imagine it's a currency note distribution by Reserve Bank of India. Whichever state, in the existing labor force, we are not even talking of new labor force, in the Reserve Bank. And I can also share my experience. We could never solve the problem of urban cooperative banks at all in this country for 30 years. And then finally, law could not be changed. Ultimately, I appealed to the state chief ministers. And I said, no, this law is not changed. Let's have a working group. And each state, was, uh, we entered into a memorandum of understanding on urban cooperative banks with the cooperatives, with the state government. And then the first one to run, to sign, uh, was the competition between Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh, <laughs> Modi and Rajshekar Reddy. And then within one year, and then we, we are able to clean up. So there are ways in which you can incentivize. And I mean, that's, that's, that's an option which should be considered. And if you take rural employment, even if you take rural employment, what is the design of a rural employment? Is it common between Kerala and Nagaland and Rajasthan? The, the problem in the state governments is that as part of the reform, I'm sorry to say, as part of the reform, provision of public goods is important. Social infrastructure is important, roads are important, hospitals are important, schools are important. Are, the, are, are they legitimately usually a municipal function or a state function? Now, that space is not available, efficient or inefficient. That's a there's a political dimension because the state leadership feels suffocated. The state leaders feel that there is no policy space. The state, state leaders feel that there's nothing that we can do. Everything is dictated from the center. So it becomes only a blame game. It's a blame game. If you, if you work, so there are some which are of national importance, yes. I think that basic debate should be there. Whether I agreed soon after independence, we didn't want uh, uh, superior tendencies, etc., uh, etc. Et but we have now reached a stage where we have redefined the role of the government vis-a-vis -vis business. If you have redefined the role of the government vis-a-vis -vis the business, if you have redefined the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the market, why are we not redefining the role of the center vis-a-vis -vis the state? When we talk of decentralization, it is weakening the state. And not, and there's no, so that, the, 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 there's a, this is getting expressed in the political processes. So that is my point. That's, I kept it last. It's, it's vague, but I think it is critical. And whether it is food or, uh, or uh, hospitals, there's a lot more scope for that. Thank you. It's interesting you, you made competition between states the last point in your speech. And then, of course, I think your passion and emotion has been aroused by uh, the question about this. In the morning when we discussed primary education, one of the key recommendations of the author of the paper, Karthi Muralidharan, was precisely that uh, there should be much greater opportunity for states to experiment, to pilot, to compete, to have the most skilled, the most literate, the best equipped uh, uh, workforce and uh, knowledge and other kinds of workers. So this echoes very much. I have a number of uh, people who are waiting to ask questions. Let me just go through. TN Nainan at the back there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Eddie, you've um, projected uh, zero revenue deficit and uh, zero current account deficit, which means you're compressing, you want to compress the revenue deficit from something like 4% plus to zero and the current account deficit from another 4% to zero. Um, what time frame do you have for this? And what do you think will happen to growth in the interim? So, no, thank you very much. I mean, as this first um, 
I am assuming that 4% is not the average that we have now in either current account deficit or revenue deficit. Admittedly, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a bad part of the cycle. So I am not assuming that in the fire plan they have assumed 2.5. So basically we are trying to look at 2.5 being brought down. We have a choice. We, we can have the average of 2.5. So we can have some years going to 4 and we are vulnerable to risk in which we are finding it. Is it sustainable? That's exactly the point that I am making. That 4% revenue deficit in one year, 4% current account deficit in his one year, is affecting the sentiments of the economy, is affecting so badly, we want to take the risk. If we don't want to take the risk, if there, if there are inherent vulnerability to shocks, now whether you want to achieve it over two years, three years, is a political economy issue. But as economists, I think we have a duty to assess what are the implications of A. If we are having a five-year plan of 2.5% current account deficit, if you say that that is inevitable, I want to have my submission is what are its consequences. Revenue deficit also is not that in a particular year it cannot be high. There is an emergency. The whole thing is over the medium term and an average. I am making a distinction, that's all. And quite a few state governments incidentally have had significant, um, uh, significant improvement in the fiscal situation. And it's not unprecedented either if you just look at it. It's not unachievable. Especially if you look at the tax regime compared to the global tax regimes. Uh, Suman Perry here. Ah. Um, you, uh, I mean, essentially your point uh, was that productivity matters. Yes. And that in a volatile global environment, um, emerging markets, India, is, uh, is perhaps more vulnerable. Yes and its capacity, India's capacity to sustain such volatility may be different from other countries because both of its level of poverty and the nature of the society. My question to you is the following, that um, as an old school economist, productivity is substantially related to trade policy. And the big boy on the block is China. Do you feel that India's vulnerability will increase or decrease through greater trade integration with China? Because that is stoutly resisted by our industry lobbies. Uh, basically, the real test of your efficiency, if, once we accept that it's a relatively open economy, at least on current account, undoubtedly we are, we are there almost. The best test of efficiency, and you have to compete the productivity growth has to be there, otherwise you can't survive. And therefore, whatever is required to be able to compete is required, has to be done. And that's the only way you can grow. Secondly, that is, that's why I emphasize the cost per innovation. And actually, I, I had originally put in this sentence, but I didn't present that point, now that you provoke me, I'll put it this way. That will be my seventh point. Public policy should not be business friendly. It should be market friendly. Simple. It, as you rightly said, business lobby, business interest, and that's where it's going. So are we able to enable... I mean, unless we're able to reach Delhi, you can't get any important business contract. With all, deregulation is one part of it in, in some activities. So I think first, we were mad. and again, you find very often, even in the urging, you must be, the government should be business friendly. It has to be market friendly. You should be able to be transparent, there should be proper competition, there should be entry. And if you have a situation where, unless your brother in law is an MP, you will not be able to start something important. I mean, that's not, that can still deliver goods. So I'm glad I, uh, you have provoked me to add the seventh point. The, the public policy should be not be business friendly, but should be market friendly. Thank you. Uh, so then uh, I have a number of questions still. Rakesh Mohan here, please. Hey, Rakesh. Now, now you can't be kind to your old boss, so. <laughs> As usual. Uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, thank you very much for uh, out-of-the-box but commonsensical remarks. Uh, but just before I ask my question, 
do you distinguish between business friendly and business house friendly? <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you mean? Uh, the uh, question, uh, two questions actually. One, um, one of the things that has been really striking me for quite some time is that a lot of the reforms that we started with in the early 1990s were focused on manufacturing and industry. And one of the most disappointing or surprising things has been that over the whole 20-year period, the rate of growth of manufacturing has actually been just about the same, or actually slightly less, marginally less, lower than the overall GDP growth. So it actually has lost weight on the economy. And now actually you have a merchandise trade deficit of almost approaching 10% of GDP. So the question is, and, and, sorry, and then to go ahead, uh, uh, apart from the savings investment issue, that even if you assume that you can have a saving investment rate of around 36, 37 uh, percent, plus minus, and uh, current account deficit plus minus one, one and a half, or whatever, um, you can't really achieve a sustained nine percent growth of GDP without the manufacturing sector really ascending to something like 10 percent growth average on a sustained basis. We have never achieved more than eight on a sustained basis for even five years. So the question one is, is it, what is it, what is it that we are missing in a macro policy or micro policy for that matter to make it possible for manufacturing to grow much faster in the future years? And the point in a sense is that we can assume that in the next 20 years, a lot of manufacturing will switch out of China given their rising wages. Where will it go? Are we ready to receive it? Second uh, question um, is that one of the most striking things about India is that in the sub-region that we're in, we have about the lowest level of trade integration of any sub-region in the world. Um, that is in the South Asia region. It's about, uh, it's about 3 4% of our uh, exports or imports are in the region. The question is, again, for achieving a higher rate of growth, is it not extremely important that we also integrate in our neighborhood and beyond in the sense of uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, etc., to the east, Pakistan, Central Asia to the, to the west and north, and of course, uh, China as well. Thank you very much. As usual, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think in agriculture, perhaps, uh, as Professor Gulati also, if I recall, has been mentioning, first we must have integration within the country in agriculture. Uh, that's one, I think, I believe is important. And uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Both agriculture and manufacturing are critical, not only for growth, but for employment, uh, and for uh, both for regular employment and for reducing disguised unemployment and underemployment, but let the agriculture should help, improvement in agriculture should help reduction of disguised unemployment and underemployment. And if you ask um, a farmer in the, in the villages, he said, what's your problem? He will always say, the government. I said, why? I said, they tell me I'll get power free. I don't get power most of the time. The one source of risk is government power undertakings. Second source of risk is government irrigation system. Third source of risk is fertilizer subsidy resulting in uncertain uh, quality of uh, fertilizer. Four, certified seeds not having proper. So the amount of, just as deregulation has helped the economy, remove the public policy induced risks on production units in agriculture. And I presume the same thing in manufacturing. So I, I suppose first is more important is removing constraints. Removing constraints at least should be the first step. Public policy induced constraints, and you have got all the World Bank studies on business indices, etc., purely from that. That's one point. But at, a, at an aggregate strategy level, I entirely agree uh, that agriculture and manufacturing um, we should concentrate because services is able to develop on its own. Thank you. The question on regional integration. In yeah. Santisha. Yeah, but I, I, I suppose regional integration and a global integration, uh, particularly in South Asia, it's more. I think the economic case for integration in South Asia has been well established, well documented, well appreciated. It's purely a political process in the importance of. But 
my impression of the my impression of the impression of the neighborhood <laughs> is <laughs> that it is india which is a large economy is not sufficiently enlightened and not sufficiently liberal uh, in uh, in uh, trade integration that is the perception uh, in fact uh, i heard one of uh, our uh, neighbors mentioning that uh, india gives a 10 billion to save europe and at the same time takes money from world bank instead of allowing us to take that part <laughs> so there is this type of uh, feeling but uh, i agree that's very great i have several other uh, people wanting to ask questions uh, so i'll take maybe two or three more uh, dr govinda rao uh, Dr. Reddy, it's a very fascinating uh, talk. Um, my question, and I'm a little confused uh, about your uh, approach to the financial sector. Um, on the one hand, you want the financial sector development. You want people to put money in the financial, you know, in financial savings. You want more, you know, sort of domination of commercial banks um, to be reduced by other uh, instruments. Um, but at the same time, you want to, to tax the financial sector. and you know isn't it a bit contradictory how do you really go about it thank you very much i think the word i used is that taxing financial sector is not a sin or something like that so the question is again the, the wisdom that was in the i'm not I, i i don't think i said you should tax the financial sector in india that's not what i said but if you ask my frank opinion you should at least as far as the tobin tax is concerned and this gathering knows that i did refer to the desirability of considering such a tax and that is the only case where i had to change the speech which was already on the website <laughs> <laughs> so having said that my limited point is the taxation of financial sector in order to discourage excessive financialization has been accepted as a possible tool we need not exclude that at all if uh, an assessment you feel financial sector can develop only if there is no tax the fact no no problem but you should not rule it out as something that is uh, that will destroy efficiency there are advanced economies which are considering that is the limited point i'm not advocating but i still repeat what i said almost 7 8 years ago that option should be on the table um lots of hands shudip to mandal only my friends are asking questions <laughs> <laughs> or i recognize all of them <laughs> uh thank you and thank you for a very rich fair in your lecture i'm i'm not sure i've absorbed it all I'm still trying to digest it but uh, briefly based on the discussion we've just had about engaging with china i wanted to draw you out on a remark you made in passing about uh, intervening in exchange rates is also not a sin just like taxing financial sector is not a sin uh, as you know china's engagement with the world and its competition in trade and so on has been based perhaps more on undervalued exchanges than on rising productivity uh, is that also a route that you think you would encourage india to uh, go well um it since it has been posed as a jocular question let me also say there is there, no it's no sin to go through the route uh, somebody has succeeded far better than us i know if that is the way you can remove poverty if that's the way you can command respect if that's the way in which you can grow 10% that's an instrument so unless you have a value judgment whether it will be workable for india because the china is different from india 30 years before is different but essentially again one one goes back to the society political context which will determine and that's what deliberately i read the tricipital score it's, it's 9% 10% is not something which has happened all, all through the history 9% to 10% is not that has happened for decades in any single country in uh, many places china has done china has done good but what is what is it that we can do and again the the capacity of china to accept or impose volatility in output or employment is something that very society very few societies can afford 
So, in economic management, we have to accept the societal uh, as, uh, constraints. And when you try to go out of it, then it gets reflected in political tensions. So, but if you ask me in abstract, I don't see anything immoral uh, in what China has done. And I don't see anything immoral in the USA has done as long as the nation states exist. I'm going to use my uh, chairman's prerogative and ask you a quick question. Um, given where we are in um, the uh, economic leadership of the country, um, what would a hypothetical finance minister um, have to worry about on a medium-term basis in your sense of the strategies for economic development that you talked about? I, I would, uh, if I have to sum up, I would simply say that you have to work towards reduction of the revenue deficit so that you have headroom at least for taking care of the shocks, both fiscal and deficit, revenue deficit. And you should be able to explain to the people. Since you mentioned about China, China is a case where one year back they said we are struggling to slow down growth. So the last four, four months they are saying we are struggling to increase the growth. I am yet to hear people who said that we should moderate the growth. Though I committed the sin, if you recall, when 9% growth was touched, once I, word, I used the word overheating afterwards, I didn't use the word, but I did, <laughs> took the, all the measures, of course, uh, what I thought. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you see, that's, that's a fixation. And so the way I look at it is that it's far better to say that this is what we are vulnerable, this is what the society is, this is what we want to do, we should do it. And the movement can be up and down. The same thing uh, I used to say jocularly, when, in fact, I must say, Dr. I.G. Patel one day asked me, after uh, the, what is that, um, one of the uh, scandals. And he said, what is this, why, no, why we keep getting this uh, sensex scandal? And I told him, sir, the public policy wants sensex always to go up. The regulators want it to go up. The only way the correction can be made is not by the market, but by a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> or a scandal. So that, that, we cannot afford that. That's all I'm saying. I mean, you, 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 we fix. It's more or less like potential output. The productivity determines. It's not fixing here a tax incentive there. Are we having policies which improve productivity, efficiency, and competition? The, 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 the real sector problems, let me put it that way. The real sector problems. And we, we are comfortable with macro. And the deregulation can give results up to a point. After deregulation, we require a new framework for establishment of markets, regulation, contract enforcement. We haven't done that. Whatever gains we got is more due to deregulation. And the second part is a lot more, uh, lot harder. Okay, I'm going to take just three more questions. So, Professor Vijay Joshi. Ah. Uh, that, that, that was an extremely thought-provoking lecture. I was uh, very interested uh, in your... Uh, I was um, intrigued by your idea that we should aim for a current account deficit of medium term. Medium term of zero. Uh, I mean, I, I can I can see the the, the point, and, but I'm not going to ask you about that. You also said uh, you also made various remarks about the need to encourage saving. So I was wondering whether you thought that as a medium run uh, policy. Uh, we should be aiming for a real interest rate of three percent. I mean, at, I mean, at, at the moment, savers get uh, hardly get a positive rate of a real rate of interest. Uh, the government, uh, of course, having a, a real rate of interest of three percent, which is the sort of magic figure that many many countries would assume, um, would imply that the the government would have to pay a real interest rate. Of and that, of course, would make fiscal correction more difficult. I noticed, for example, that the 13th Finance Commission's calculations of fiscal uh, of the fiscal trajectory until 2015 assumed a real interest rate of zero, which, is, of course, that's true. The government borrows at zero, but but if you want savers to have a positive real interest rate, then the government has to pay a positive real interest rate too. Sorry, I, I don't know if that's a that's an intelligible question. Yes. I, uh, there is uh, definitely there is an issue of um, how 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 
essentially it's not a question i'm not talking about a number uh, but basically do we feel that the policy is um is at least adequately saver friendly i mean the the the, the, the is the tax regime more friendly to investment foreign investment than domestic savers that's a question which domestic saver can legitimately ask what are the numbers we talk of i think we should answer that question because the domestic savers are contributing more than 90% for our development they are more stable if we are talking of relative secondly as you rightly say it will increase the government's borrowing program and what is the government's borrowing program who, who is being taxed in the government's borrowing program indirectly the saver through the banking system so therefore revenue deficit down fiscal deficit down is all part of the package but at the moment and and clear, i would simply submit the clear sign of the disenchantment of the savers is the reduction in the household financial savings and the import of gold and this is just the beginning of the desertion of the domestic saver second most if you just look at the increase in the high net worth individuals practice of the foreign banks in india almost all high net worth individuals savings are rooted because a saver within the country has to pay high taxes relative to a saver who can manage to take the money out of the country and bring it back so there is a set of policies i am not saying interest rate are what it is we recognize that the balance is required between savings and investment if you agree with the strategy if you say the strategy should be i got a strength of 90% stable source i got a strength of 10% but this is another argument is competitive efficiency is increased by foreign investments that is fine and also we, our capital can go i am quite open on that part but the limited point is zero current account deficit but large current account in proportion to gdp similarly the The balance. There are signs that the balance in the macro policy is perhaps not in favor of the domestic savers. At least this should be examined. Is my submission. But there is, and cost of intermediation is high. We blame the banking system, but half the time the cost of intermediation is high because the government is preempting, and that gets reflected. Okay. Two final questions uh, in the front. Ashoka Modi. just wait for a microphone only friends so far <laughs> we only invite your friends <laughs> so dr reddy the the one number about india that is most striking is its inflation rate yes amongst all the reasonable countries in the world i'm not including zimbabwe and so on india's inflation rate is the highest and has been persistently the highest. and when the lady asked you the question about food prices you punted that question essentially if i may say so by saying decentralization uh, to states and allowing states more autonomy but that is a long term thing you on, on the on the other hand you are asking for higher savings rates the indian saver has essentially been taken for a con game for the last 30 years and you yourself have just outlined why the saver is losing faith in the system so why do you think that essentially the reforms have to be microeconomic that might take 20 years and in that period the indian saver continues to hold faith with this high inflation rate and therefore zero to negative returns on savings isn't there pro- isn't there a problem in the time frame of your suggested policies and the outcomes that you wish to achieve thank you thank you very much honestly uh, this was also hinted by professor nainan how what should be the time sequence uh, i think uh, it's useful to consider the time sequence in the alternatives also you look at the status quo policies and what is the time sequence you you proceed 2.5% current account deficit etc etc so my limited point is there is a problem between short term and long term there is a problem between macro adjustment and micro adjustment but the most important and, and, and I'm, not, i'm not in a position to say how to handle the sector of policies but the most striking factor is 
that am, am india is, since independence for the last 30 40 years relatively we had a better inflation record than many emerging market many developing countries in the re, that's what i'm in contrast in the re, very recent past india is having one of the worst inflation records and why i think that is the one critical question and there can this be solved by macro management? Increasingly, and I, I mentioned was an illustration about the power or uh, the risk, the, 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 the production units, except very big uh, businesses, almost every production unit uh, is facing significant risks because of the infrastructure or the services or the quality of inputs. This is the big issue and that has to be solved. So if the whole package requires a more realistic growth or it requires more painful adjustment or both, we should honestly face it. It's not that you have some way of stimulating the economy. My, the point I'm trying to make is some way of somehow you, you, you stimulate is not likely to work that because you've got to adjust on current account deficit to reduce the volatility, you've got to adjust the revenue deficit to get the headroom for policy, you've got to adjust the fiscal deficit to be able to reduce the financial repression. And if we don't handle that, we are operating at the, this is at one level. And then you have micro uh, improvements. Perhaps, if I, I'll be more honest if I say that most of us are perhaps underestimating the painful adjustment that is required to be at the growth rate anywhere near what we're aiming at. Uh, Sujit Bala says 9-10%. If you really want 9-10% on average for the next 10 years, there's a lot that we've got to do now. Perhaps we are not considering the serious challenges and the capacity of the society and the polity to manage those challenges. Um, I see many hands, but I'm just... Okay, Swami. Swami Nath Sankar Shri Ayan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Swagnathan Iyer, Economic Times. Uh, two things. First, on the question of whether the states have to be given more autonomy for fast growth. To me, the most remarkable outcome of the last seven, eight years is not just the acceleration of the Indian GDP. It is that the state, the Bhimadu states, the states that were traditionally dragging down India, many of them have become among the fastest growing states. This could not have happened had there not been enormous policy space for the each states. I mean, if Orissa was a very slow-growing state and in a very serious fiscal crisis, uh, and then Naveen Patnaik came and was able to change everything, there must be considerable autonomy on the part of a chief minister and of the political system that allowed Naveen Patnaik to convert Orissa from a uh, bankrupt state with a very low growth of rate into one where the finances have improved phenomenally and the rate of growth has improved phenomenally. And we are now told that, you know, the Maoist problem is so deep and it's particularly bad where there are minerals, it's particularly bad in Chhattisgarh. And Chhattisgarh is doing 10% growth, GDP growth. Bihar under Nitish. I mean, apparently the mayor act of putting 38,000 people in jail under the Arms Act was a sufficient incentive for the growth rate to suddenly go to 10%. So when you go around the totality of, pol of policy space, it would seem to me that in fact we have proved that there already is a very huge amount of space. Otherwise, the transformations that we have seen in some of these places couldn't have taken place. And if you get the appropriate chief ministers saying that, you know, if I want to get re-elected, I have to be like Nitish or I have to be like Naveen Patnaik or Raman Singh, that to me is the most important thing for achieving appropriate political policy. The kind of lectures that we are having as to what we can do with regard to current account deficit, fiscal deficit, this is not the kind of thing that is moving the, the real structure. I mean, at the we all, at the most cynical level, of course, when you say, what are the aims of the politicians? It is not a question of whether we have 6.5% or 8.5% growth. The first fellow says, first, I've invested so much in the election and coming to power. How do I get a rate of return on all the investment I've made? 
And secondly, how do I at the same time ensure that I get re-elected? I mean, these are the two overwhelming issues on the minds of politicians. They have to be married with some of the outcomes we are trying, and that's where the problem arises. It is not an accident that you got business-friendly and uh, not market-friendly outcomes. Because what they said was in certain areas, we will indeed have market-friendly outcomes. But everywhere that we have the market-friendly thing, we reduce our ability to get a return on the election expenses. So you then have to create other areas which are business-friendly as distinct from market-friendly. Otherwise, they say politically the system will not go here. So it seems to me that, you know, uh, you have a high opinion of the Planning Commission saying if we set a target of 2.5% of CAD, we will somehow be able to live. I mean, it seems to me that uh, we are driven by events more than attempting to actually control the events by controlling these things. But it seems to me that the political economy somehow has to be got right. Within that, it seems to me things like how do you reduce the amount of money in politics? How do you get a kind of judicial reforms uh, which, which, which result in people being a little more afraid on some of these areas? It seems to me if you don't tackle some of those areas, it would be very difficult for any of your economic prescriptions to take place. No, thank you. I entirely agree that political economy has to be is critical and that's why every time I was repeating the socio-political context is important and if the socio-political context demands that business friendly only delivers growth, my submission will deliver growth up to a point and not beyond a point. So I think that's the limited point that I was making. As far as uh, the states is concerned, I entirely agree with you, the states are performing well when there is policy space and perhaps if there is more policy space, they will do even better. We are not on a different way. The question is whether they have adequate policy space. If I may quickly mention, when we were children, we used to go, the high schools were run by district boards and municipalities. After 20 years of decentralization, all the schools were run by the state governments. And now after another 20 years of decentralization, many schools are run by the central government. And the admission to schools is dictated by the central government, what weight to be given to which mark at a national level. So that is the, the policy space that's available for the state governments. And they are not even permitted to have their own admission policies. Uh, um, so I mean, that actually is a different matter. You had a different reservation in different states in terms of social change. So we can debate whether the policy space is adequate or not, and there is some literature on which, which activities are appropriate at what level for efficiency. So Kumar Chakravarti's paper on multi-level planning, etc. Uh, but I, I, we are on the same level that that decentralized policy space, genuinely made, uh, could lead to competitive efficiency. So I think we are on the same wavelength. As far as the CAD is concerned, uh, yes, you are right. Actually, we recorded 9% growth rate when the CAD was close to zero. So, but my point is, if you have a program of CAD and if you target it, and if you miss it, that's one scenario. The other is, we target something which is more realistic. And what I'm advocating is that that the highest growth rate, the fairly high growth rate was achieved, not necessarily, due. you can also say about the lag effect, but both global experience and our own experience doesn't relate it. But a more open economy, which is slightly different, a more open economy, and I, again, I still remember, I, Dr. Aiji Patel once says, that it does not matter who owns an industry, uh, as long as it is efficient and productive, and, and of course, it should not have any externalities uh, in terms of security or uh, other factors like finance. Um, okay, one last question, Karthik, and then that's uh, where we will end. Uh, Karthik Murali there. And please make it brief. Yeah, in some sense, I mean, Swami asked 80% of my question because uh, I wanted to come back to this theme of states. And so let me just ask the remaining 20%, which he didn't, which is, it seems to me that given every problem we talk about fundamentally seems to get stuck at a political economy level, this is one solution that principally has a lot of potential because every party controls some state. So the real question is, why are the major parties not able to get to some kind of agreement at the center? It's a, you have some states, we have some states, like you mean, and so let's just, let's go. Is it because the chief ministers are weak in one of the leading parties? Like, you know, I mean, and, but even if that's the case, the locus of political accountability is now so much more at the state level, because from the voter's perspective, most of the things that affect the voter are things that he sees at the state level. It seems to me this should be one thing that we are able to build a consensus for at the national level, across parties because most of the strength is coming from regional parties and they should want more autonomy. So why, is, why are we stuck in 
not being able to decentralize more and just giving the states more space. I, I, I suppose if we, if I have a very simple question, centrally sponsored, uh, illustration, centrally sponsored schemes. So that is an instrument which you say you won't get money. 50% I give you today, after five years, you take over the whole burden. And therefore, that is, there's no need for compulsion. But that's, uh, that, that's, uh, uh, well, what type of diplomacy is it? Coercive diplomacy. So it is coercive incentives, if not imposed incentives. And I've been issued the, the financial powers are, uh, are uh, loaded very much in the, in the, the center. But if the position, if, as again what I'm saying is, is it our stand that at the moment there is enough policy space for the states? My submission is no. The largest ministries in government of India are in the subjects which are on the state list. Education, irrigation, health. They are essentially municipal subjects. And those have been expanding. And my limit, having served both in the state and the center, definitely the political leadership feels extremely constrained, maybe both for other political gains, but for, even for initiatives. So we have to re review. And second, again, as I said, the, the risks of centralized policy mistakes, <coughs> even in developmental programs, we must recognize. Uh, with that, uh, I certainly heard a lot today that would tell me that the 14th Finance Commission is going to have its work cut out for itself. But with that, uh, please join me in congratulating. <laughs>